Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. On a Saturday afternoon in 1995, my dad and I were doing the washing up or something in the kitchen, and Charlotte Green, the continuity announcer on Radio 4, announced that it was exactly half past two on Saturday, the 18th of February, 1943. The old dude and I were called up a bit short on that because it was definitely not 1943. What followed was an ambitious adaptation of Len Dighton's bomber. Now, Len's book looked at one fictional bomber command raid set in 1943 and the crew of Lancaster O. Orange and the defenders that were preparing to meet them and the people of the town of Elkgarden, which the bombers destroy and was not their target. The adaptation was broadcast throughout the day so that you were experiencing what the characters were going through at the same time. So it ran for the whole afternoon and up till midnight. The result was a classic of Radio 4's drama output. And nearly 30 years later, it remains as impactful and as poignant as Len's book did when it came out in 1970. Now, everybody's going to introduce themselves in the introduction for this, but just to let you know who we have, we have the fabulous Alice Arnold, who played Anna Luisa. We've got Jonathan Ruffle, who produced this thing, Adrian Bean, who directed it, and Joe Dunlop, who had the unenviable task of adapting it. Now, in Joe's case, we had a little bit of trouble with his audio. It's a long story. His isn't as great as everybody else's, so I apologize for that. But you can hear everybody, but it was a really great time. So... I will let them all introduce themselves so you get to know their voices. And we'll see you at the end of the show. Yes, I'm um, I'm Alice Arnold. And I was in this epic production um, many, many years ago. Um, I was doing something else at the same time, which we'll come to later. But um, yes, it was uh, part of my, my radio drama career, which I loved from that bottom of my heart doing radio drama and and I was probably in I don't know three four hundred radio plays and you forget a lot of them um I never forgot this one wonderful so you'll have things to talk about for us <laughs> I hope so a little bit so also with us we have Jonathan Ruffle hello sir who are you yeah I'm Jonathan Ruffle and I produced this production of Len Dayton's Bomber adapted by Joe Dunlop, directed by Abe Bean, and uh, starring Alice, amongst others. And as she has just said, truly a uh, an extraordinary production, and one I've always felt, strangely, very little to do with myself. I've always thought amazingly lucky to have been in the right place at the right time to be part of it. Fantastic. Aid, hello, sir. What was your role on this one, even though you've just been introduced? So we'll say it again because. Yes, I'm Aid Bean um, and uh, and I directed Bomber and feel so lucky to have been able to do it. I, I remember being in the room when Jeremy Howe um, first introduced me to Jonathan and, uh, and told me about all of this. And he's wrong, of course, when he says he had nothing at all to do with this because he brought the whole project to Radio 4 and it was regarded as a completely madcap venture by the diehards of Radio 4, who'd never imagined that anything like this could be done. Um, and of course, Jonathan coming from Radio 1, um, uh, professed to know absolutely nothing at all about how he made radio drama. And he was absolutely right. He knew nothing at all about how you make radio drama, which was the <laughs> best thing possible, because it meant that he just came into it and said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do it like that? Well, I'm sure we can do that. And we did it. It wasn't easy always, but we managed to. Fantastic. And last, but by no means least, we have Joe Dunlop. Hello, sir. Hi, Matt. Yeah, I'm Joe Dunlop. I did the dramatization of Len Dayton's book. And uh, the way that uh, happened to me was I was actually trying to do All Quiet on the Western Front. And uh, the commissioning editor said, oh, no, I don't think anybody's going to be interested in that. And so, you know. Thing. I said, oh, I think it's anyway. The next thing was he got in touch with me. He said, How work? I? He said, I've had this mad person from Radio One bothering me with this book, and I'm I'm gonna bike it over to you. Have a look and see whether you can think of a way to turn that into a radio drama, radio play. 
So yeah, that was how I got started in it. Yeah. But I, I would just like to sort of back up what A just said, you know, that to me, what Johnny really contributed was his sort of, you know, why don't we do this? It was a kind of, oh, okay, you love this, Johnny. This was a wee bit like, um, what's his name, who did Citizen Kane, Orson Welles. He'd never directed a film. He'd only been theater director. And he went to Hollywood and he said, no, no, you can't shoot that way, kind of way. You can't have shots like this or that. Then she said, well, why not? Let's do it. So, yeah, that was a great thing. But, of course, your greatest thing, really, the contribution were, were those interviews you did with those survivors because they really, they're the ones that get the tears. Well, this is another Johnny Ruffle thing. But gets beery tear rolling down my leathery cheeks, um, which actually I don't even need the beer. Uh, some some bits of this thing really when these old hear these old voices you know of these uh, two kids at the time it's hugely moving. It's, it's interesting you say that Joe because I was listening to it and, and it occurred to me that we couldn't make this now we couldn't make Bomber now with and have anything like the effect or impact that we got with Bomber um, even if we rec re included archive recordings of um, reminiscences of what it was like to be there at the time on either side, because the great thing about it was that those people that contributed to the program were actually alive when we made it. They were performers, not performers, but they were actual contributors. They were part of the of, of, of the pro of the production. They weren't just some something we took off the shelf and inserted to kind of give it very similitude. Slow down, sir. We're going to come back to that. You're taking my questions from the bottom of the sheet. That's that's. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all, that's all. Thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you for for sort of wasting your Thursday evening with me for this one because I've gone back and read the book, and I've listened to this again today actually to do, and it is it holds up. It is a really remarkable piece of work. So. We're going to delve into it, and we're going to go to that Radio 1 guy showing up with a crazy idea to start with. Because, Jonathan, why Bomber? Why did this catch your eye when you're in the wrong side of Broadcasting House? I'd read it as a, when I was grape picking in France, and I'd been, I'd pick, I, was, I thought I was picking up 633 Squadron, and instead I was picked up this book, uh, which we all now know. And it's worth saying that as a book, it, how, how different it was, uh, because it predates by the book predates by 20 years and we predated by five the, the resurgence of the Second World War into popular culture, um, by which I mean, um, in 95, I can distinctly remember people saying to me, well, this is the last World War Two drama there will ever be. There will be now six or seven years later, there was. Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, and and we're off to the races. And also in bookshops, there are now you know you'd expect to see Anthony Beaver and James Holland and all this. There's none of that. There was none of that. It was though the Second World War was not in anybody's cultural pocket at that time. It's an amazing desert of it. It was basically Max Hastings, Len, Alfred Price, a couple of other bods. Um, and when I say it wasn't in the zeitgeist, it it wasn't sort of. You know, there's no sort of political pound shop Churchills, you know, talking about the war to prove something. It just wasn't out there. People just didn't talk about it. And it was the kind of end of all of that. So when I brought the idea to Radio 4, I brought it to them much more in the sense of nobody seems to know anything about this. And it was coming up fresh, I think, for Radio 4. It wasn't, oh, here's some other twerp who wants to do something about the Second World War. It was kind of arrived new. And... Um, Len's amazing gift to talk about ground crew, to talk about firemen, to talk about civilians, Alice's character, for example, you know, a, a rad girl, talk about that more in a bit, if you like, um, you know, ground crew in the UK, the, the, what we'd now call the tail of, 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 the, uh, of the operation. His, his desire to do the Germans and the British, the British and the Germans. This is important. This was real groundbreaking stuff. And we'd just been through the first Gulf War and I'd been a reporter out there and it had been all about smart bombs. And I knew that the history of bombing is the history of missing. That's what bombing is. It's what you miss along with what you occasionally hit. 
So the energy of the production actually lands, really, if you think of it. And of course, it only had to get through two gatekeepers at Radio 4. Jeremy Howe, the drama guy, Michael Green, the, the Radio 4 guy. And once they said, yes, that was it. If they fixed a date, bang, we're off. That's it. There was no, the, the, the 18 months of palaver you would now go through, none of that existed. So it was surprisingly fresh, which you can't kind of see now looking down the telescope in the opposite direction. And the reason they took me on to do it was because the BBC was much so like the civil service in those days. There was this amazing thing where if you were in one department, they lent you to another department for six months to go and do something else. And the idea was you'd come back. You know, people people in Radio 1 normally went off and directed Top of the Pops or something. And I just went, you know, I said, I'd like to go and do this for six months. And the BBC's, it was so civil service. They just sort of went, oh, yeah, so it's rough as a pretty good chap. You know, send you, blah, blah, blah. you know the bits of, you know, the, you've got Docket 907, <laughs> sign off on this, you know. And that's, that's how the BBC operated. It was this weird, crusty old joint. It's not the young and, you know, the hip hop, you know, wonder that we all know now. And uh, so, although it looks really weird that I'd get involved, the other thing, of course, they've got with me, who'd been fruitlessly trying to get it away on television for years, you know, God knows why, um, uh, was they knew when they got me, I'd been around the world with Simon Bates carrying a satellite dish. I'd been, I'd done various other bits and pieces. I'd flown on the Lancaster of myself anyway, because I used to blag things like that on Radio 1 anyway, and been in submarines and done all sorts of things. And they must have thought, he's mad, but he's totally engaged with his subject. You know, he's a, he might be a one-stop shop for a, a lot of research we now don't have to do, because he's so crazy. He's immersed himself in this as his sort of parallel life. And uh, that's why it got picked up, I think. That's why of all people, and what I meant earlier was, I've always thought it was just amazingly, I just felt just such a, the privilege of working on it has always been the bigger aspect of it for me. That's, that's what I was hinting at earlier. So that's, that's how I think it came together. When did the idea of broadcasting it over an entire day come? Was that later on in the process, once you were fleshing it out, or was that part of the pitch? Well, as I remember, Jonathan was saying he wanted to broadcast it overnight. First of all, <laughs> well, when Radio Four was not <laughs> yeah. on the air, that would have been good. Exactly, and you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine the response. That. <laughs> but I don't think any radio. I think Radio Two went through the night, but no one else did. I must admit, I never, I've never heard that. Mm. I remember a meeting in uh, Jeremy Howe's office where he said, well, "Well, as well as doing the play, Jonathan's going to make a documentary. He's going to speak to these old guys." And, and we'll make a documentary. And I think I was the one who said, well, why don't we run the documentary and the play together at the same time so that you actually, you know. And I will write, and which I did, I wrote a dialogue that I knew the listener wasn't going to hear, but the, the actors could say while the narration or the, uh, you know, the interviews were played underneath that. Um, and I think that the marriage of those and I think whoever uh, I do aid, I think we are definitely the music. Uh, although Jonathan's pretty good, we were later on in, on the cruel scene. I remember you were trying to ask it for the music that time. Um, yeah, but the well, music that... I think really tugs at the heart. So yeah, I think was was what I think that was a key moment actually deciding that the that we'd hear the old fellas talking as part of the play rather than that here's a play and now here's a documentary about it. And as time went on, and this was Roger Danes, if I remember correctly, an aide in the edit, you, you were able to lose so much because an old voice would tell one part of the, the, the story. Of, uh, this is really your area, eh? but, you know, would tell one part of the story of the bomb waiting to blow Alice to pieces and then and not, then Tom Baker would pick up the next bit of that story. One of, uh, in the background, as, as Joe so rightly says, there'd be some off-mic dialogue infilling other bits of information. And then the characters would actually pick up the story and go in and out, in and out in this. I've got to hand it to you. It's an incredibly sophisticated 
piece of work that and that was i think because you were we were able to present to you a joe's script and the work that i was doing present you with something that you could take what we were giving you and throw a lot out and keep it simple and the choices you made were absolutely superb absolutely superb and indeed while i'm so i can stop talking Joe's choices of, of the themes and the plot lines and the characters he followed from the book is something like 600 pages. Your choices, Joe, were absolutely brilliant. Well, that's, in a sense, that's Len Dayton and the book, isn't it? Because the way that the, the impact of the book comes from all of those various inputs all coming together, as you say, the bomb going off at the end is um, not just about a bomb going off. It's about the news coming to... August back that the woman he's going to marry has been sleeping with his son. It's about the fact that the telegram has just been delivered to the parents of the um, bombardier, the armourer, who was loading the cookie when the jaw broke and it fell on him. It's about the pilots, the crews getting back and being safe when we know that other people aren't safe. It, 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 that's the beauty of the, of the book, that all those various strands all come together at, at particular points. Um, and so, yes, you're right. It, it, was, um, it was a kind of a distillation of, of all of that. Sometimes we had your guys and, and, and women whose reminiscences told us what was going on. Sometimes it was... Tom's narration. Sometimes it was the characters that that Joe had had, had adapted from the book, um, but it was it was a kind of um, it was just a, a, a very powerful process, really, which um, which which really just came from from that that book originally, of which the, the, there's very there's a, the, there isn't anything else like it, or or rather there wasn't at the time. I think there is now, as as Jonathan said, there's the way that that, that people write about the war and military history and things like that is, has been revolutionised um, following the way that Len has written about it. But it's interesting hearing you talk, you all talk, about the whole picture of the piece because as an actress in it, you're not aware of the whole picture of the piece. You're aware of, of, of your part in the piece. And so all this stuff, going on in the background with the with the material and the interviews and we didn't really weren't really aware of that I mean we did know they'd been done but we, we weren't really aware of it until we heard it because when you're in Maid of Ale and you're you're a little group I mean I didn't even speak much to the people who were playing the English people you know that that's how it works you you're, you become in your group and you're called in for your scenes and you do your piece of it and you're not really aware of all the other stuff that's going on around. I mean, I was aware of all the boys playing the playing the air crew and their plastic cups, but um, but you know, in that which is how they did their healthy. I remember trying them trying to perfect that for ages. Sam West, <laughs> desperate to get that right with his plastic cup over his mouth to make the sound right um, for the aeroplane. But other than that. I was involved in the German side of it. And I, I, all this the whole picture was not part of my experience until I heard the piece. Well, hats off to Joe for that, because I remember many occasions when Joe was in tears, practically, trying to, to work out how all of these different strands and all of these stories, as, as uh, the, the arcs of, of all these characters that Alice is talking about, he was trying to bring them together which is difficult enough in any play, but to do anything over three and a half hours is even more difficult. To then have people saying, right, what we're going to do is to break this up into various sections and broadcast it at different parts of the day. And Joe, what you've got to do is write something which will hold the audience's attention and allow them to follow the lives of all of these characters over nine and a half hours, effectively which is what the, the total transmission time was. But that was revolutionary. As far as I know, that had never been done before. Of all my years of radio drama, and I still had a fair amount under my belt even by then, 
Um, and I was working on the other side of radio drama, on the broadcasting side of putting the stuff out. That had never been done. This real time event, it was event radio in a way that I'd never come across before. You know, the day dedicated to it, it was Bomber Day and it was redone. Um, and, and as far as I know, has that been done since? Ever. A thing like that in real time. I think I think there's been a Piper Alpha drama, hasn't there? Well, that was done in real time mm. like that. I don't know. I, uh, elements of it, it were, been. I think. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was that was the that was that was that was one of the sort of um, tentpole sales points was to split it up and do it in this way. And as as we went on, then we started getting other shows on the day, and all the junct all the program junctions carried updates yeah, yeah. and bits of information. So the whole day was kind of it became bomber day, and I don't think anybody's ever done well, that. I don't. Uh, again, I don't think the, they have. the sort of grab everything, and it's all but, about the same thing. No, I don't think anybody's. But as as Aid says, that's a very radio. That was a very radio one thing to do. That we we, yeah. we were having Prince Day and Madonna Day, you know. So I'd have brought that on board without blinking, you know. That, that wouldn't have worried me at all. I know, but for but for Radio Four to alter its schedule and put drama at a time when there was not to be not normally drama, if it wasn't two fifteen in the afternoon or whatever, you know, was that was no. I, I don't know that you'd get that through now. I mean, as you say, there are only two people to get it through then. You know, this would take you six years now and, and, and even then it wouldn't happen. So um, you know. Lots of reasons it wouldn't happen, actually. But um... the fu the fury when they were talking about changing the Radio Four <laughs> schedule the other year, there was there was petitions and everything, wasn't oh, there? Uh, you, you don't. There are questions in Parliament if you want mm. to the beginning time of Women's Hour. You know, so it's extraordinary that they managed to actually have slots that were not drama slots that were used for this. Was amazing. And, well, it, and it wasn't easy. I mean, there was a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. but the the. The, the impact, the way that it affected the listeners was unbelievable. Mm. I remember getting letters for a long time afterwards, and, and the, the recurring theme from those listeners was that they'd, been, they'd just tuned in to the afternoon section. And as they were listening to it, it was having an effect on them, and they would start putting things down. And, and then when they realized it was going to go on for the rest of the evening and into mid, uh, up to midnight, they... Sh they kind of cleared their schedules and said, well, that's it. I'm not going to do anything more now. Um, and I remember at the time that um, that I was listening to it myself on, on broadcast, I listened to the afternoon episode and then I, had, I forget what it was, but I had to do something. So I had to jump in the car and to go off and do other things. And of course, you put the radio on. And I remember, listen, I remember hit this weird moment when I heard around about tea time, the, the takeoff section, um, I remember hearing the football results being announced, um, and and these were kind of um, put next to these guys getting onto their plane and flying off to Krefeld. And the fact that you knew that you'd, you'd been with them beforehand when they were learning where they were going to go, and now you were listening to them going, and you were thinking, right, well, the, the, the very fact that you were listening to the radio and, and, and life was going on, all right, that was life in 1995, but actually it made you realise that in 1943, mm -hmm. life was going on mm -hmm. when these guys were getting on board their planes and doing what they did and people were in Krefeld not knowing what was going to happen to them. It was, it was an, in, an unbelievably and I think unrepeatably powerful experience for listeners and, and, and it's very hard to... to to, to repeat that. But I, I, get, I come back again to the fact that Joe principally had the difficult job of trying to make all of that work because making all of that work dramatically, keeping it together, tying it, finding the peaks and, and, and making sure that you're going to keep the listener with you, um, very hard, very, very hard. And he pulled it off. But it would have been so different if that had been three, one, three afternoon plays. You know, it just would not not no. have held that that attention in the same way and the fact that you know the midnight that the, the last piece felt felt late at night you know i mean it, there's a difference in in how drama sounds and well did, did anyone have the same experience i did which was i was kind of having having listened to part um the raid part three i i, I was i was kind of and i made the sodding thing i was still waiting 
for, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was waiting for those aircraft to return. I was like Emma Chambers' character, thinking, are they going to come back? What's going to happen at 11.30 when, when those aircraft are supposed to come back? It was a fantastic conceit. I think this is a lot of this is down, it's then date. I mean, I know we did it, well, we did it for the rate. One of your questions, actually, Matt, uh, on the, uh, the little trip sheet you sent us was uh, that uh, was about something that was about, oh, God, I've now lost my track. It was hooks. Hooks were what I was looking for. Hooks all the way through it. And Len keeps you page turning. But, you know, I felt I had to, because it's so easy to switch a radio play off, that really they had to be grabbed from the very, I think, you know, within the first minute or so, Bomb definitely de does that. Um, and I think, uh, well, you just need people to sort of stay with it. I, Funnily enough, I was doing a voiceover for money um, somewhere on the Monday, part of the, this weekend, the Saturday of this show. And uh, I cheekily, well, no, I just didn't, I didn't say, hey, I was the guy who wrote that. I said, look, you didn't hear the radio thing on Saturday, did you, that bomber thing? And he said, oh, yeah, I did. I said, what do you think? He said, oh, it was terrible. He said, it really was. He said, it was absolutely that you all for he said, you know, I mean, I listened in the afternoon. He says, I listened in the, it was my own fault for asking him, wasn't it, really? But anyway, I said, what did you think of it? And he told me, he said, he, he said it was awful. He said, because, he said, I like to watch Casualty, you know, on a Saturday night. I never miss it. And of course, I bloody well listened to Bob at eight o'clock or whenever it was, you know. And in the bars, as they, it, the, some of it was on at midnight. Well, now, why did they just divide it up into uh, three Saturdays? No. And I was so <laughs> tempted to say, well, actually, we did consider that. We've considered every bloody way there was to break up this boot and to do it. But I did. I, I did my voiceover, took me money. <laughs> went, well, lived happily. I've got to step in here, if I may, to something that Joe did. Um, we're talking about you know, wrestling this thing to the ground. There, if we go back to Alice's bomb, the bomb that kills Alice, it has this earlier role, as you said, Aid, where it crushes an armourer to death. And um, I've always thought, God, Len, what a, what a, yeah, God, he's good, because there's this wonderful line in the play, uh, which is very Len, which is, um, you know, after they'd hosed down the inside of the aircraft, they winched back the, the bomb back up, the bomb which was unharmed. You know, unharmed. fantastic yes. Len irony. <laughs> it's not written by Len at all. Joe wrote that. And I've always oh. thought it was Len, and it's actually Joe. So Joe managed to not only compress, you know, and massive plot lines and these hooks you're talking about, Joe, but you actually managed to, I don't know, inhabit the, the soul of Len in that way and get those kind of things. Because even during, I mean, I don't want to sound flippant, but we did laugh quite a bit in the control room because Len <laughs> just was so fantastic at these sort of in a small family car type lines. <laughs> and... <laughs> And you just think, God, in the you way of bombs. genius. <laughs> yes, in the way of bombs, it, it you know, eviscerated this. It eviscerated. Always, you know, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> terrible stuff. And then this, this tone, my God, if, if the production in terms of the performances, the performances, the script, the direction, the tone, this is the, uh, it's only taken me, what, 40 minutes to get here. The word I've been hunting for is tone. The tone of the production yeah. is appropriate. And what's the evidence of that? The Bomber Command people said they liked it. Now, I, I, I said, have, yeah, 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 I, ha that. I have that. to jump in while we're on adaptation because this, the book is very different, especially the first hundred pages to where we drop in, in the radio show. So for the radio play, we start with the air test with um, O Orange, uh, Sam and the crew, testing the aircraft we meet the characters there in the book they're all at kosher's house for the weekend which i guess would have made it 
a lot more Radio 4E, BBC -E entry to it, but it doesn't quite drop you into the jeopardy of what's about to happen. Was that the thinking around it, Joe? Okay. One of you, uh, yeah, uh, the question is, how do you uh, adapt something for another medium, really? Now, when he biked over the book, I started reading. I'm a very slow reader. I can't read any faster. I, mean, I can't read without moving my lips, basically, um, <laughs> because I've done so much. So many talking books and stuff that really I find it very hard to read. You know, I read with, you know, I need to have the stress in every line that I read, you know, when I'm reading just to myself. Quietly, I don't do reads aloud but anyway. I read the book and it would have taken, I mean, I probably read that book quicker than I read many of them because he was wanting an answer sort of within a week or so. Um, so I read the book and the way I dramatized, and I did the same with all the adaptations I've ever done, like Georgie Go that we did, Aid, which is so much fun, um, is I read the thing and then I think about it and the bits I remember, I make an outline from the bits I remember. And I thought the first 30 or 130 odd pages of that book really were not of any interest to me. And I can hardly remember it. It was sort of, there was a kind of a, I think there was a nod in the direction of anti Semitism. There was something about somebody had escaped from Germany. I, yeah, I, I, anyway. So, and the other thing that I do is I sort of, then from that point of view, I, I would just sort of think of it in terms of a big flashy Hollywood movie or a big flashy British movie. I mean, except it's got better pictures than any movie because it's all in your head. So, um, I, I just tell the story again for a, a new media. Yeah. That's all. That's all. <laughs> you make it sound so simple, sir. It's, um, how, how stressful was it pulling apart this book? Because as we've been saying, there is a lot of different narratives going on at the same time through it. So how, how do you make that make sense for the listener? I think that was solved by having a, a narrator. I said, we need a narrator because we've got 37 speaking parts in this. And so we need to have somebody who's taking us by the hand and letting us know where we are at any one point and who they are, who are all the people. So that, that was the idea of the narrator. And, and I wanted, I'll tell you who I wanted to do it. And I said this to both the guys, but act, uh, writers have been Quite right to casting none, basically. <laughs> you would right. have been playing all the parts, Joe, if you'd had your way. Lofty. <laughs> I wanted James Lofty. He, uh, he was the head man on the world at one or something um, on the radio. I, I thought it's not an actor's job, but Tom Baker was fantastic. Tom was fantastic. You're, you're absolutely right. Tom, the word to use was scary because, of course, what people forget is that, um, you know, Tom wasn't providing that narration uh, having listened to the drama or to any of the performances. As I remember, he was one of the first recordings that we actually made, I think probably on day one. And we just sat down and we went all the way through Tom's narration. And he very, very, very quickly picked up on the tone. Um, I, I don't remember whether this was ever said. You might remember, Jonathan. But, um, I mean, certainly listening back to it, I, I, get, I get hints of Laurence Olivier in The World at War in the tone of Tom, where he sort of, plays a sort of resignation and there's a note of resignation and a sigh in in the way that he plays it and I don't know whether that was ever discussed um but anyway he he, he kind of gets that absolutely right but of course that was all in his head so he was he wasn't hearing the performances he wasn't hearing the scenes he was just having to play that line and so it was his imagination he was he was painting that picture but had decided in his own mind that this as uh, you, you used the word scary. I, I, um, I would sort of use the word menace, possibly, because in some ways his role as the narrator was not just about telling us what was going on. It was helping to provide the listener with some sense of the inevitability, or, or maybe inevitability is the wrong word, the, the, the unstoppability 
of the events um, in, in the drama. And so the way he made it unfold was like a very, very, very scary film. This is going to happen now. And this is going to happen. And this has happened. And so you're carried along with it. And he was, he was absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he was. I, he said to me, and I hope he, if he's listening to this podcast, and he doesn't get pissed off with me for saying this, but he came up to me and wanted to change some of the lines because he said, you're giving it away. It, it, with the line I remember, I think I remember this exactly, was he said, and all about the last flight of O for Orange. And, and he said, no, no, you shouldn't say that because, you know, you're giving it away too soon that they're not coming back. Of course, they were coming back, but that, like, that plane... Exactly. There, there was a tension there. Um, so, um, with one of my hooks, and I, I said, you know, and he's, well, I think, you know, and he wouldn't be quite sort of, you know, in that way of his. And um, I said, no, 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 I think, I think, I think I'm happy with, with how it is. So he then accepted that. And indeed, do you remember, we all went over to the tennis club that first day because it was only yeah. him that was getting, we had the read through, then we started knocking on the, you know, doing the narration. And he said, let me buy you a drink. And of course, Matt, you won't know this. Um, the thing is that the director usually buys the drinks. There's uh, the first drink of the production. Um, well, I mean, I don't know whether that is a thing. We know you I don't, seem Joe. to remember that. And with the writer offering as well. <laughs> Hopefully. Oh, being, and I, oh hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, no, no, no. Let me buy it. Said, I've got a very rich wife. <laughs> I always remember that. And I've used that so many bloody times since. Thank you, Tom. So many times I say, no, no, let me, let me buy this round. I've got a very rich wife. We should explain that the tennis club was the BBC club at Maida Vale. And so you went under a sort of tunnel opposite the studios out into the most stunning tennis club with very good tennis players. But it was the BBC club for Maida Vale. So we got whatever it was, cheap drinks, I suppose. In the days, of course, the people did drink at lunchtime um, during Radio Drama, which for many, many years, I mean, honestly, it was hard. Not for Bomber, I hasten to add, but for other pieces of work, it was not really worth going back to the studio for the afternoon. But that was a very, very long time ago. And that culture, thankfully, did change. But yeah, and basically, if you didn't drink with all the right people, you never got another part again. So it was... <laughs> I spent many, many hours at <laughs> yes, it was partly, it was partly for the actors mm. to get the next job. Absolutely, it? it was your next yeah, job. So, so when they yeah, said yeah. Are you all coming for a drink, yeah. you definitely went. I mean, otherwise you weren't going to work again. So you know, the social part of it was huge. But uh, but but it was a wonderful time. Bomber was not like that. Bomber was much more intense, and also it wasn't warm. You know, I'm thinking about summer productions when you sat outside and watched people play tennis and did all of that. It wasn't wasn't quite the same when it was winter and freezing cold. Just super briefly, super briefly, if I may, about Tom Baker, who I only knew as Doctor Who. Um, and I was actually scared mm. that the audience wouldn't climb past the idea of him being Doctor Who. Mm. And, you know, the idea that the, a Time Lord might go back in time to 1943 and also be able to talk about, you know, when the when a bomb blew up six months later, you know, was he time travelling? You know, I, I had real concerns about this, especially since he had an awe-inspiringly unique voice. And it was a fantastic performance. But the thing I just want to quickly say is... He'd obviously read the script, an incredibly quick read of the script to understand those scenes. But I, I was only here for a tiny bit of that recording with him. And I remember you, Aid, and you, Joe, setting that scene up for him so quickly and directing him so well on those tonal ideas. Because if he hadn't embraced, and I'm picking up on your menace point here, Aid, is um, he also got the workaday nature of the of the raid it happens yesterday it's happening today and we'll be off bombing Duisburg tomorrow and we'll be flattening Lubeck next week he got that it happens the 
is it quotidian this idea of a daily a daily drama flat he whilst you say that he heightened the emotional points he also flattened out the emotional points in some fabulously creepy manner and that's you aid that's you backed up by joe certainly not me i actually i'm not don't really think i was there for that i was off editing tapes i think because the idea that guy got that onto tape and it's perfect for every scene over three and a half hours of stuff i mean what that's extraordinary congrats well, well, his performance, I think, was groundbreaking because you hear so many radio dramas that follow Bomber where a narrator is used in the same way and performs in the same way as Tom did. Uh, it, it didn't exist as a, in, 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 in quite in the, in the way that it does now before Tom Baker and before Bomber. No. Yeah, he did actually. I ran into him and uh, sometime after, that, uh, after the broadcast, and he said, oh, he said, my dear fellow, I'm getting so many phone calls from <laughs> voiceovers and stuff from, from your bomber thing. You know? so, so, so it was a very happy ending. Yeah, it all worked well. It all worked well. Alice, I must say that every time, you know, that, that performance of yours, it just works so bloody, bloody well. You are so skilled. It, oh, what you you do. Just add on Thank breath. you. That's very sweet. And I remember you. You know, the cruel sea. Alice is wonderful. Oh, God, I can't uh, remember. Uh, Paul Reese. Oh, Paul Reese. What's his face when in, in the cruel sea? Oh Thank dear. You. Mike Wall thing played it. Uh, he the weak one. He didn't really want to go. He was worked in a bank and he didn't really want to go. To sea oh, Michael Maloney. Like Michael Maloney. Oh. Of Paul Maloney. I loved working yes, with him. Yes, I remember. What an expert he is. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. There was one trick I think I miss, you know, in that scene where uh, uh, the guy gets the, the, the cookie falls out of the, of the plate. I mean, I want to give credit to uh, oh. Colin Guthrie. I think he was the man who was on was. doing spot. And we had yeah, to get the good. sound effect of a bomb falling on somebody on a thing. I mean, quite a difficult uh, thing to do. And he did, he did that really well. Colin Guthrie was, was a legend in spot effects. And uh, gosh, I, can't, I couldn't count how many hours I spent in the studio with Colin. But I had intimate scenes with, with Jack Shepard. And, um, and I remember, you know, we'd all done. I don't know how to put it, but we'd all done scenes like that before. But this was, yes, well, yeah, these sort of deep a, yeah, breathing and a, a all... bed in the upstairs section of. I can actually picture it now, um, <laughs> at, upstairs in the in Maida Vale. And I think age, you kind of asked people who weren't involved to to leave. But so it, it was oh, yeah, well, it was a bit, <laughs> even though obviously we were fully clothed. But the one person who wasn't fully clothed was Colin Guthrie because he played my body, basically. Do you remember this, Aid? It's, it's a bit of radio drama I've never forgotten. And he, had, I mean, he took his shirt off and sort of slaps and skin contact and stuff were, were Colin. And, and so he was, wow. he was really closely involved in that. I mean, he was brilliant at everything he did. He could also play the piano phenomenally well. But, um, but he, was my, he was my body. And, and all slap and skin contact effects were Colin's chest, not mine or Jack's. <laughs> but um, I remember that really clearly. I remember him being brilliant. And if it hadn't been oh, him... That's... It, it probably would have been hard to do it without laughing or whatever, but because it was Colin and I knew him so well and he was so brilliant at what he did. Another Colin, Co Colin Guthrie, we needed somebody to play McNamara's band, okay, uh, in the pub scene. And he'd never heard it. And he was dying to go to the loo. And this is not a word of a lie. And we ran out of the studio to the toilet with me singing, my name is McNamara, I'm the leader of the bat, as you, as you know, which of course I'd stolen from Stanley Holloway in The Way to the Stars. That's how the only reason I knew it. So I'm singing it to him 
as he goes, and I'm sort of standing by the urinal, not looking while he's going, still singing it. We get back, and Colin th- sits down and plays it. He uh, could do yeah. that. He could listen to a song and just play. I mean, this was a, some kind of insane talent. I wonder where Colin is now. Well, um, he's gone to a grateful and happy retirement. Because I last worked with him in 2018 as a uh, doing radio drama. And he's as he's weighs. You know how he weighed about twelve, you know, eight stone soaking. Yeah, wet, yeah, he's tiny. You know? he's, he's tiny. He's completely. He hasn't changed at all. He's got a bit greyer, but in in heart and soul and energies, he's exactly the same. Exactly the same. And Mike Etherton barely changed at all. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And, and and all of the the whole team were unbelievable because they were being asked round the clock to produce some pretty amazing effects because you know not just the raid, not just the, the you know the, the trying to recreate um, the sound of being inside a Lancaster bomber being shot up by umpteen mm-hmm. cannon shells in 11 seconds or or being in on you know the streets of Altgarten while you had 400 bombers dropping however many thousand tons of bombs on you they were they were also just having to do as Alice says the regular um, radio drama business of making life seem real and then as Alice also mentioned earlier the uh, the quite ridiculous thing of sticking plastic cups in front of the the actors who were playing the the, the air crew and um, and giving them the, the the sound which we couldn't find any other way of of kind of recreating. And I remember when, when this was discussed, I thought, this is just a joke. This is just a joke. But it was the only way to get that genuine sound of, of people talking into an intercom through a, an oxygen mask. Yeah, I remember all the boys trying it and ending up with that. And you were going, what, what we're going to do that? And Sam West was like, we're going to do that. And then, then, then they did it for the whole thing. And it worked. But the sensitivity of Spotify. I've got some wonderful photographs of, of that. Am I right in saying that they they got the plat the paper cup, which I would call a crackerjack, crackerjack, B, you know, BBC cup with BBC written on it, and they put? Am I right in saying they put um, a head mount made yes. out of a of a, yeah. um, a coat hanger, metal, a wire coat hanger, so yes. they could hold their script and have That's this right. thing essentially floating but in front of their face? They were sitting is there. That, all is that the what time. you're remembering, Alice? Yes, absolutely. But I remember them trying very... I remember the first time someone did it, I think it was Sam, and we all went, well, that's the sound. That That's the sound. So how are we going to do that? Are you going to do the whole thing, holding a paper cup to your mouth? Can you hear me, Dunty? Can you hear me? That's, it was like that. That's exactly how it was. Yes. And it yeah. worked. Yes. And, and the nice thing was, I think they forgot that they were there. So uh, pretty much as you would expect, you know, when, when suddenly the flat goes off and you're, you're in a position where you're supposed to be performing dying, mm-hmm. you're not thinking about having a, pl- a paper cup in front of you. Yeah. You, just, you just do what you not yeah. naturally do. And so you actually got moments where there was a kind of a, not quite feedback, but there was distortion, um, which, which was, seemed very, very real and very natural and authentic. Works splendidly. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Director of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A-20G Havoc. The A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier. In the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission, uh, I think bombing WeWAC. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s and in the early 90s it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had, they restored the one Helen Pelican which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. They used a lot of the parts from this aircraft for that aircraft. Then actually went to a civilian owner and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration put it on display here. 
it's a unique aircraft in the fact there's only about four, if I recall, A20 Havocs anywhere on display in the world, with one in a private collection, one at the Air Force Museum, one here, and one in a private collection in Russia. But uh, I'd say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft, I think just because of the lack of them as survivors and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball, bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports. And, you know, they're like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships. Um, so I just always found it to be a pretty cool airplane. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. I'd love to know, Alice, when this script arrives, were you, because you were part of the, um, the, the Radio 4 drama troop for want of a better expression not at that time were you not no i don't believe mm. no i wasn't because um well when was it what were the actual dates that we did this 95 this was early 95 yeah um i i must have just yeah. completed my second time on the rep so i was on the radio drama company twice once for 18 months which was what you did when you then yeah the happiest days of my life was doing that. And then, you know, the directors and you do lots of radio plays in between. But by that point, I was also had started doing Radio 4 continuity. Mm -hmm. So I was a con announcer, as we called it then, and had just but not been doing that for very long. So I didn't read the news, but I did link the programs and do the shipping forecast and everything um, under another name. So I did that under Katie Arnold because I was in so many radio plays. I mean, we dropped all this eventually, but I was in so many radio plays that it was a bit ridiculous that Alec, that, so there was Alice Arnold and Katie Arnold, just to confuse everybody, <laughs> which was the same person. But when this script arrived, I remember, well, A, there weren't so many parts for women in it. And, um, and it was clearly a huge project that I was desperate to be a part of, but I had already got I, I don't know that Abe knew this, but I already had my shifts for Radio 4 continuity over those holidays. And so I did both. So I was doing, I was at Maid of Ale in the, and I often came to you having had basically no sleep. Perhaps that's why I was all right in it. <laughs> that was great. That worked. I, I didn't, yep. Yeah, there we go. I had the right wow. time because I was very tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I was going and doing a late shift, you know. I was double double dipping at that point, um, trying to earn my crust, and uh, <laughs> but there was no way I was not going to do it. So it was like, no, I'm I'm absolutely not not doing this. So I just have to make it work. However, I make that work, and wherever I get my sleep, I'll get my sleep. But I'm not not doing it because it was clearly a, a phenomenal project to be a part of, and you know that when you see it and you see the pile of the scripts and 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 what it is and and yeah so it was just a massive opportunity that i couldn't miss but i was quite tired i do remember that <laughs> but when you read anna louisa what did, what did you think of her as a character because listening back to it now she's she's got a lot to do in very targeted segments throughout the the show she has to convey a lot how did how did you how did you approach her Oh, golly. I mean, oof. Asking a question 30 years after you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yes, I know. No, that is that is hard to remember. I remember thinking about sort of vulnerability. I remember that. Um, that um, and the sort of the joy, the joy of radio drama is that you can play someone who's quite sexy when you're not yourself. And um, you don't, I don't think I looked remotely like, and that's that, as I say, was the joy of radio drama. You could play parts which you did not look. Sea of, sea of shocked faces on my screen so, here, dear listeners. Sea of shocked no, faces. I, yeah, I don't think so. But, but that was what was so lovely about it was to be able to play those, you know, alluring women and, you know, you didn't have to dress up for it. You just did it with your voice. And that was, and then, and then the rest depended on the 
people you were acting with. He he was terrific as uh, uh, what's his name, Jack. He was amazing to work with. I remember. I remember that. I mean, it was another reason of definitely doing it. When you see that you're playing opposite him, you're, you're not turning that one down. Mm. And he was, uh, yeah, he was yeah. actually very easy to work with. Very, very relaxing. You know, he, he was a, a big name, but absolutely lovely to work with in every respect. Can I just throw something in there, Matt? Yeah. Because. Um, what Alice um, isn't saying is that she was absolutely right to play that character, and the there was a, there was um the, one of the difficulties involved in casting uh, the piece was that, as Joe said earlier, there were thirty six, thirty seven parts in the play or, or, or actors that we would need to, to 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 cast, and so you've got to think about making sure that characters are differentiated and. They sound different. You can, they're easily recognisable and you know who it is. But more than that, what I was looking for and what I got with Alice and with everybody else in spades was an authenticity because they just they just played the character. They didn't try to overlay it with anything. The, 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 the story is so powerful and the world of, the, of Bomber is so powerful that you don't want to kind of confuse that by trying to make the characters something they're not so there were very many quite um understated performances what alice's character was going through was huge right from the start she's living a lie she's pretending that she's something that she's not as many people had to do during the war um and she just did that absolutely perfectly and then you find that lots of other characters are doing a similar sort of things and those things started to become more um, recognisable as, 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 as the piece went on. It was, so it was a joy working with people like Alice because she knew that what they were going to do, and, and, and as Joe said, with, you know, with Jack, um, they were going to give you the characters, and that's really, really important. You've got to believe in those characters when such outrageous, huge, hugely dramatic things are happening to them over the space of a few hours. But I think that's also, that's in the, A, in the writing, that you can do that, and B, in the atmosphere that is created in the studio. And I do think certain productions had, and that this is absolutely true of Bomber, had, a, had a, an atmosphere all the way through them of truthfulness and authenticity, as you say, but just there was... No one was putting that on. It was. It was. It was all. It all felt very real. The whole atmosphere of the whole piece. I think everyone was so invested in it that that you didn't need to be layering. Oh, I'll do a funny accent for this, or I'll do. You know, what am I doing? Which you know, some radio drama was a bit about that. You know, I'm Australian today over there, and I'm Welsh over there. You know, um, <laughs> there was a bit of that when you were on the radio drama company. This was not like that. This everyone was totally invested in what they were doing and there was a an overarching atmosphere of the whole set of all the people in it um from Colin Guthrie to all the cast that made it feel real and then your job is a lot easier but also the writing you know if the writing's good you don't have to do very much if I remember rightly a lot of that was coming from Jonathan because the green room as I remember was um full of <laughs> The world of bomber, absolutely. You know, uh, videos, well, models. We were yeah, immersed um, in it. I think that's the yeah. word. It was. It, it was sort of immersive because it was a lot of days and uh, you know consecutive days. Plus, we're in Maida Vale, which is kind of better because Maida Vale Studios are rather separate from the rest of the BBC. It's the only. It's the only drama going on there, so you're not mixing in the green room with somebody doing you know, the archers in the, in the next studio, You're, it's, it was all wrapped up with Bomber. And, um, yeah, I, and, and we were, for, for all that time, sort of hunkered down, I guess, to be what it felt like. Pick, picking up on Alice's point there, um, it was also between Christmas and New Year, the recording, mm -hmm. and that is actually a time of year that has a slightly hunkered down 
uh, atmosphere yeah. to it, sort of nationally. Uh, if, and the idea that then you were also a, a gang, for one of another way of putting it, in a radio studio, particularly that geographically isolated radio studio you're talking about there, that it it, it sure as hell helped the immersion mm-hmm. into the story. Had we been trying to do it in brainwashing house in high summer, blah blah blah, yeah, yeah, would have been a lot. Would have felt lot, different. Lot would have felt different. Some of the actors who were playing the air crew, particularly who were practically as old as you know, the characters of um, Battersby, you know, um, 18, 19, 20 years old, who were actually quite, um, you know, far removed from the world of the Second World War. Uh, and, and as earlier we were discussing, Jonathan, you made the point that before this came along, talking about the war and talking about military history wasn't as cool, if you like, as perhaps it is now. Um, and so that we, had, we had actors in the show who were not as familiar with, shall we say, with World War II and military history and aviation and things like that, as certainly you and I were. Um, And they needed to be immersed in that world that that would, so that they could believe that at their age, at the age of 18 and 19, they could have been in a Lancaster bomber flying at 20,000 feet over the hellish fires of Altgarten. Yeah, I I can find the full cast list of all those boys, but there were lots of them, weren't there? Yeah. Sam, it was such an interesting thing that he did. He he was in the central location in the studio, as I recall, with um, uh, some, I um, can't remember the actor's name now, playing the flight engineer on his shoulder. And we literally two feet behind him with the other characters playing the other things. But they wore headphones, so they were unable to communicate directly with each other. They had these ridiculous cups on producing this effect. But if you take the example of Flash Gordon, who was an actor, I think, called Ian Peck played Flash. He might have played Jimmy Grimm. I can't remember. Anyway, the point right, is... He was Flash. He chose... If I... If I remember it rightly, he chose to not mix with anybody and he stayed in his rear gunner position, which was down a sort of corridor of sound baffles. I mean, he obviously came out for lunch, that goes without saying, but but my memory was he isolated himself quite a bit during the production because rear gunners were isolated. And I seem to, and I've got a photograph of him sitting there looking bloody miserable, <laughs> bored out of his mind, which is in fact a very good thing for the, for rear gunner, you know, an interesting note for a rear gunner. But he pinned on a music stand, which he used for his script, a picture of his girlfriend. I thought it was a very interesting investment by him as an actor. Um, into that role and while we're talking about actors Alice was brilliantly cast as you so rightly say but my god hey you really did do an incredible job with that cast an extraordinary job with that cast I mean there's not a duffer in it as as we professionals say I was very lucky because and this is absolutely true of the 36 I think 37 actors in the show I got everybody I wanted on first call, bar two. Wow. Everybody had the same response that Alice did, which was, I want to be involved in this. And um, the normal worries and problems that you have about trying to record something over that period of between Christmas and New Year, which when either actors are in panto or that's their downtime, and the last thing they want to do is to spend nine or ten days in a studio when they could be sitting at home having a drink. Um, they read those scripts and they just wanted to do it. What Thanks was the to... first read-through like? Because that must have been quite yeah. something, because this is going to be a big, big, long production. You've got a whole pile, a whole... What, what is the noun for many actors? Is it a gaggle or a swarm? I'm, I'm not quite sure. There are many nouns. <laughs> Joe, you know them all. <laughs> no, none, none of which we can say here. <laughs> I tell you what else, though. A whinge of actors. Yes, probably a whinge. <laughs> but you would never get a radio play now with a cast of that many people. Oh, it's you, incredible. You, the, you can't imagine the budget no. in those no. days for for drama with 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 crowd scenes no. and mass scenes and loads of people. Just didn't. Was there an actual budget? And who had? Did you have the budget, Jonathan? I'd love to know that. 
No, if if anybody managed that aspect of it, it was Adrian. Well, no, it wasn't that me. That would have been you, um, eh? Uh, no, no, it wasn't me because I was a freelancer at the time. Uh, I'd, I'd buggered off from the BBC and was doing other things and came back to do this. So nobody told me anything about how much it was costing. Uh, I had no idea. Oh, Look, didn't they? Who no. was in charge then? Who was in charge of the money? <laughs> Jeremy had okayed the script, hadn't he? So it, the front page had the number of bods on it, and he would have been able to work out for himself the amount of doubling that might have been possible off the back of that. And then Marilyn Imry took over, uh, yeah. and she actually shepherded the thing into the studio. But I think, it, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for them. But weren't these the days when people said, well, if you're going to get three hours and 40 minutes, that's, you know, the same kind of money and the same number of bods as we'd use for five 45 minute dramas. I haven't done the maths in my head. Therefore, well, he wants to do it with about 40 people. Yeah, sounds about right. And that was about as in depth, I think, as those sorts of discussions got during that period. But I could be completely wrong. Maybe it was being fine tuned, but well, I think different, different days. days absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, different that's your license fee at work dear listener your license fee at work i think the read through was without events i mean there was no kind of drama there was no kind of thing uh, everybody was sort of enthusiastic and we read the thing and it seemed seemed to work the thing is that script had been through about 33 drafts i mean that script was Somebody said, no, I will bomb her in the studio next week. I said, yeah, and I can't wait to see the fucking end of it. I said, <laughs> I said it is true what they say, but frankly, I said, I said, I am tired of re It was mostly Jonathan's fault. Because Jonathan kept checking, is that Len Dayton or was that you? I said, I don't know which, which now. I have no idea. I never went back to the book once I'd read it once. That was all I did. I told it was me telling it after that. So anyway, you know, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of drafts. So really, I suppose one of the things that people kind of realized was that we weren't going to change anything here. Unless... I'm not that kind of writer. I'm not the kind of writer who, if somebody says and and instead of, you know, but, uh, or, or something like that, it would worry me. I mean, uh, what, what I, I feel is that, you know, the, if the actor's comfortable, if an actor couldn't get their tongue around some line, I would say, what would you, mm. what do you want to say? What do you want to say and let them say it? You know, as long as it meant the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm not kind of fussy about that, but we, uh, yeah, we really did nail that thing down. So that all the technical stuff, which maybe a, would be more interesting for your listeners <laughs> than all this actor stuff we've been doing, um, would, uh, uh, you know, that was all accurate. So, so when that was when good, it's yeah, playing it shot by the guy from, you know. The, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Dominic Lovenhurst, yeah. uh, uh, Victor von Lo Lohens. Uh, Lohenhurst. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. That, the, yeah, the, 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 the slow motion thing of it, the 30 shells hitting the plane and, and what it did to everybody. Um, I mean, that was all accurate. And also, when Len came to the thing that was one of the things he said oh he said how did you get on with this business of the real time he said because that was he said around my study i had all the you know the flight time to there to be going over holland flight time to there you know all that kind of stuff he'd done all that and then jonathan double and treble checked that all these things were exactly, and that was well done to you, Jonathan. Well, we did that thing, didn't we, where we did the time checks. We did this briefing scene, and there were synchronised watches. And really early on, we said, wouldn't it be great if when they synchronise the watch, that is, people, if they glance up at their clock, they'll actually see that time go through. And then, of course, you do the, Aidan, Roger Danes do this amazing edit, of course, it lengthens, it shortens, it gets bigger, blah, 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 blah. And we're changing the stuff as we're going along. And in the end, of course, you had to, as I say, have a choice. 
the, I remember the actor, can't remember his name now, standing there going, it's sort of 354. <laughs> 355, 356. <laughs> yeah, so we could cut it, cut it in later. And yeah. it was a conceit. But uh, similarly, the first bomb went down, at, I think it's half past eight, and the second raid starts on time. And it's, it's yeah. elements like that that, that um, I don't know, they have, that, they, have a, they have an unusual character. In some ways, the most important line of the, of the whole drama, I think, was... Um, was Charlotte Green's introduction right at the very beginning. And she says something like, it's exactly half past two on Saturday, the 18th of February, 1943. And it does two things. First of all, it makes everyone go, oh, right, it's half past two. Mm. And it sets up that idea, as you say, that we are going to be in real time. But then the other thing it does very neatly, very cleverly, is it sets up the idea that what we're doing is we're, we're doing something which is real but actually, it's not real because there was never a Saturday, nice. the 18th of February, 1943. That, that gave me a thrill up my hearing that this afternoon. It's I wonderful, to get, wasn't it? I'll tell you what I did. I listened not to the whole thing. I listened just to catch Charlotte Green reading the end credits. So I could actually remind myself of the names of the actors who, you know, I mean, you know, obviously, Alice, and Sam West and people you remember. But I couldn't remember... Poor Dominic, and um, yeah. So yeah. <coughs> well, I'm trying to look. I'm trying to look on the for a cast list here, but I can't find one. So I'll have to go and listen to the credits because I can't get one on the on internet. Yeah, there's one on yeah. IMDb. I'll pop pop it in the. Uh, on the it's email it's not the full whack, but it's um it's quite a few quite a few bods. Right. Somebody's put that up there, calling it a video on IMDb, and I certainly haven't stopped. Oh, them. is that, like that what it is? Okay, that's why I didn't open it then. Um, I'm going to look now. As we're talking cast, we have to talk about Emma Chambers, who plays Ruth Lambert, Sam West's wife in, in the show. I've always adored her, and she is so understated in this piece. What would she like to work with? What, what would she like? Because... Yeah, it's it was terrible news the other year to hear that she passed. She was wonderful for me to work with um, because she was she was a, a, an absolute joy. Um, I I'd never worked with her before, but um, she understood the tone that we were after. Um, did some magical things um, with with her performance. I remember that the, one of the moments which still sends. Um, shivers down my spine and, and, and brings me to tears is that moment at the end of the takeoff sequence when Ophir Orange yeah. lifts into the sky and and she just says, take care, Sam, I love you. And it's just a phenomenal moment because she underplays it so much. She doesn't do it for the audience. She says it for herself. You know that that's real and it's a wonderful thing to be able to do something like that. And it's the last moment of that seek of that section and it just feels like you're listening to something that really happened in the same way as some of the the wafts that jonathan was talking to um say things that are so powerful you know we were the last people that these lads the last women that they that they spoke to it, she just she she managed to, to 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 get that absolutely perfectly. So it was a, it was a joy to work with her, I and I was so sad to hear that she would passed. Uh, as, and, and sad to hear that um, Frank Windsor had of course yes. had passed as well. Because um, mm. to get someone to come in and play a part like Bomber Harris, um, I wasn't actually sure that we'd get anyone who would want to play Bomber Harris, to be honest. Uh, but Frank was raring to go. He was <laughs> I couldn't hold him back. He loved Bomber Harris. Yes. Well, the statue of Bomber Harris had only been put up three years previously, and had been and had been um, vandalised in ninety two. Yeah. So that was that was one of the few live stories about Bomber Command. the The perception of Dresden and the Danbusters, and that was it. They had the idea mm -hmm. of this worker day, ordinary night for Bomber Command, which is what Bomber's about, is is, is completely missing. But what, but while we're just here, something you alluded to there. Um, about uh, the voices of the of the of the people uh, of the of the veterans, I was struck. So I listened to a bit of it today. I was struck how I, either I was terrible at editing or I made some quite good choices. But 
we we didn't make the German voices in particular. I, I edited them quite a bit to ensure that they if you didn't immediately understand them, the because of their accents, the context would tell you what it was they were talking about. But we didn't cut. We didn't make many allowances for the audience. The audience had to pin their ears back if they wanted to hear this stuff. And I'm not sure I would have the courage to do that now. There's, a, there's an example of this when um, it must be Lovenhertz has been hit by anti-aircraft or something, and he's cra- and he's crashing or something, and uh, and it's narrated by Peter Spoden and um, uh, Carl Heinz Johansson. Um, and they're saying, yeah, we had to get out of these planes and the guy wouldn't get out. And then we, and my, my Funker, he wouldn't climb out because he didn't want to get out and be hit by the tail as he jumped out. And I climbed out and I realized I was still attached to the aircraft by the wire. Now, none of I've explained that and made it sound like it's all clear and straightforward. But actually, it's a 75, 80 year old German guy saying that. And it's quite complex. The language choices that they make about the way they choose to explain things. And I, I, I'm really pleased we let them have their heads. That's not quite the right word. But I didn't edit, the, edit them up the yin yet. It was zoo. I let them feel their way round. And then you let them, t- you found them the spaces, eh, to let them be real. This is the point I'm trying to get to. I've gone the, really the long way around this story. I apologize. But you, we got to the point where they weren't being unreal with the utter precision of their story. They undernerd their way into that 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 lady that you quote there. Oh, I can't remember her name. It'll come to me in a minute, um, but I will come to it. Um, that moment where she says, "Yes, we must have been the young, the last women. Yes, the last women they ever saw." And I don't know why, but I had the brains to leave that hesitation in. It had been so simple to edit her and make her tighter, but I didn't. Thank God. I mean. <laughs> The reason that it works is because you know that, that that thought is occurring to her. That thought is occurring to her as she says it. And there, there are some wonderful moments. Some of, the, some of the high points of the whole drama for me are, are in what those people are saying, but at the points at which they're saying those things. Uh, and, I, and I think one of the successes of the drama for me was that I think the audience did listen to it in a way that they possibly wouldn't now, or, well, because you couldn't make Bomber now anyway, the intention was to make sure that people, well, for me, people had to, the audience had to follow all those details and complicated stories that Len was setting up. Because if you didn't follow them, if you didn't know what a, an oboe pathfinder mosquito was, then you wouldn't know the significance of those aircraft being shot down or having to turn back because the, the sets were failing. So it was important that people did listen to what was going on. And I think we managed to to create an atmosphere where it was possible for the audience to listen. So when Peter Spoden starts talking, uh, you respect the fact that he's talking from a point of experience and having lived it. And if 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 he doesn't quite get his grammar correct, that matters no more than it matters that those irks talking at the beginning about um, clearing bodies out of Lancaster's don't necessarily speak perfectly grammatically. It's what they say. I also wonder if um, what we think about the fact that, of course, it was being broadcast the once. There was no streaming. There was no anticipation it would be released on cassette. Oh, how sweet. Funny old days. You know, not even CD, probably not really invented. You know, the idea was unless you listen, that was it. No, no spooling back on iPlayer. Because that was it. It was live. And because of that live, and this is our our correspondence who said, thank you for ruining my Saturday. I couldn't go anywhere because I had to stay by the radio. That was the live nature of this. And that, that, that meant they had to pin their ears back. Truly, they did. Yeah. I was just going to say on the Peter Spoden sections is that was one of the rare occasions, especially then, that you heard a German fighter pilot speaking like we'd become so used to hearing the few being interviewed. He was talking about the technicalities of shooting down an aircraft. Now, even listening to it again today, it is very rare that we hear a German accent pilot talking about how you go about shooting down another aircraft. We're so used to British, Canadian, American 
Australian voices talking about shooting down Messerschmitts and things like that. But to hear the the rather straightforwardness of him doing his job at the same time of that edit of um, S. Sugar getting hit, you're also having the the lady who was on the ground at the same time. So you have those two completely different aspects of it playing out. I, I don't think they're intercut, but they're sort of next to each other. You have Spoden speaking about shooting down the bomber and the, the German lady talking about trying to survive an air raid. And it's, it's just chilling. And then you cut to poor Alice stuck in a, stuck in a house with some dodgy SS chaps. And it's, um, yeah, you're not, you're not giving anyone any time to catch their breath. It's just sort of trauma upon trauma, which makes it work so well. I think. When I interviewed Peter Spoden, which was down in Munich, um, I'd driven down there to talk to him. Um, and, uh, at one point in the interview, he said to me, of course, I look at you now. And he, and he said, and I looked at my sons when they grew up and I realized that, you know, because I was 35, I think at the time, 34, 35. And um, he said, uh, and I realized how many young British men I killed. And this is embracing your point, Matt. You know, yeah, there's the sort of taka 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 school of, of fighter, you know, cabbage croats over the briny uh, wing commander. You know, we know that, but we don't know. Uh, and I, I must admit, I found it slightly shocking sitting there opposite him and um i've got i've, I've filmed him as, at the same time on just a locked off fsvhs camera if you go on my website you can see footage of spoden talking and i've i've honed in on though these very bits you're talking about the absolute practicality of well you want to go between his 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 two f fuel tanks and shoot and crane your plane up so it stalls and shoots it but you've got to fall away was if you don't, you've got a blazing, exploding bomber will follow you down. You know, this grim, this absolute practicality of why he survived the Second World War. And I think he got 44 kills. I mean, this bloke, this bloke killed nearly five, you know, 400 plus young British Commonwealth servicemen. He killed them. He absolutely killed them and he burnt them to death because if they didn't go down to the bottom, the reason they shot them down on, in, on fire. I didn't want to just blow them up is that because the German reporting system, he couldn't record it as a victory unless he saw it burst into flames on the ground. What an extraordinary idea that is. We didn't get that into Bomber, I'm afraid, but there's something he told me on that, on that meeting. There's young men wanting their, you know, they want their crosses or they want their, well, in this case, roundels on their aircraft. So of course they're going to do that. Because they're young, that he's twenty. I mean, that bit in Bomber, you know, I've got to come, since we're on Spoden, this was this was an example of the documentary foot of the, the the that stuff driving drama. Because there's that sequence where uh, the RAF boys are getting into their kit and they're listening to jazz on the wireless. And Spoden had told me in Germany, yeah, we we used to tune into the BBC. Because it's got the le jazz showed, it's got the hot jazz. You know, we couldn't get the Nazi Germany. It was it was untermentioned music. There was no black music in Germany. But they were young lads who wanted to go out dancing and chat up birds and you know this. That's who they are. And the idea that we you then a eh, did that crossfade from listening to the music in the UK to them tuning into it and spoke and saying, oh yeah, yeah, we used to listen to the BBC because we were we couldn't get any good jazz in Nazi Germany. And you're thinking, holy hell, you yeah, know this is fantastic. I heard that again today, and I was just knocked out by that. Anyway, that's Spoden. Right, we we've, we've been we've been chatting for for a while now, so let's let's start looking back at it. The reaction at the time was because I was one of those people that my dad and I caught it doing the washing up at two o'clock on the Saturday afternoon and popped out to get the radio time so that we knew when the next bits were going to be on. And my mum probably didn't forgive us for the rest of the day as we were sitting there listening to the radio in the kitchen. Um, but I, you know, chatting to others, it has only ever stayed long in people's memories it's, it's it's something that people don't forget once they've listened to i was just wondering how looking back at it now because it's been well it's nearly 30 years now isn't it it's how does that feel to your good selves having having made it that there's this radio show that went out over 
three three and a bit hours on a Saturday afternoon that were when as soon as I mentioned we were doing this, immediately people were terribly excited because people are still buying the the CDs. They're still yeah listening to it on YouTube or wherever they can find it. I'll just be brief about it, but I think as I said at the beginning, there are there are a few things in your life that that in career or whatever that you're really proud of and that that were different and iconic and and being immersed in radio drama as I was for a huge part of my life this one sticks out and um because it was it was it was different it was in real time it was about a an incredible story of and 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 story of tragedy and it was it was emotional and the cutting in of the narration and the real people and the you know it the whole body of work was something different and extraordinary and if you wanted to introduce someone to radio drama and say take your imagination here because I can't I I find it very difficult to listen to anything I've ever been in because I can only ever see myself in the studio doing it. I'm sure at age you feel the same. You 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 watch the actors in your head. Um, it's really hard to do it. I have to listen to radio drama. I'm not in to to do that imaginative leap. But that's the joy of radio drama is that your imagination takes you wherever it wants to take you for much less money than television. And um, and if I was trying to say to somebody, this is this is how deep it can go. This is how hard it can hit. Have a listen to this one. That's that's what I'd say. That that's the sort of legacy it left it left me with. Well, I'll come in second then and say um, I hadn't heard this uh, show for about twenty years, quite long back. What I mean, this okay, and I was blown. I was blown away by it. I mean, I'd forgotten really instead of tough times of actually writing it. Um, it now seems like it. As Matt said, when I explained how I did it, pretty easy, really. But um, <laughs> I've forgotten all about the bad stuff. And uh, not the bad, I mean, the difficult, the, the, alone in with the, it wasn't a typewriter. I did actually have a computer. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it was a fabulous uh, team effort. I mean, all these wonderful actors. Um, who were in it? I mean, and everybody met uh, uh, that Sam, Sam West, and uh, the way he sort of they all sat together, his crew, they all sat together in the canteen. They, you know, and he was kind of giving them advice on all kinds of things, as though he really was the, the captain of their ship, you know. Um, yeah, it, uh, no, I mean, it's a fabulous thing. I personally don't know how many people are buying the cassettes. I, I don't see too many uh, um, uh, royalty things, but hopefully this, you must go, <laughs> those of you listening, <laughs> must, after all, go this, and buy it. You, must buy buy it. you know, you must buy it off a, a download from BBC, <laughs> wherever they are, whatever they're called. Uh, yeah, please buy it, you know, because old men are waiting and uh, <laughs> middle-aged men are waiting for, you know. For our 23Ps, yeah. it's, so we might. It's all about the economy. <laughs> Needless to say, Joe, I did it as staff, so staff no fee. So I've never earned a penny. I've got, ah. but there you go. Know, that's how no, it always works. If you were freelance, surely you're getting some kind of royalty out of that CD. Eight, I know that less than I are. I, yeah. Um, I, well, I haven't seen any recently, so maybe I need to what talk to somebody about that. Yeah. But I certainly did get some money from it. Yes, yes, it. But I'm with the thirtieth anniversary. I mean, all of you should be writing in and saying, surely the thirtieth anniversary, you've got to have a rebroadcast on the main channel. I think it would be amazing. I, 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 and it would be something that, that would be, you know, it would be fantastic if we could do it. Because I think yeah. that, um, again, like you, Joe, I, I listened to it for this program for the first time in about 25 years, um, all the way through, and um, was personally kind of, kind of wrecked by the end of it. And, and was, I was amazed at how well I think it stood up 
the, the, you know, it's very, it's a very, very powerful piece. And just when you think, oh, I've heard the worst um, uh, that I'm going to hear now, something else comes along and and just gets you in the gut, and you think, oh my god, and. One of my intentions when making it was to try and make the thing as authentic as possible, but not just in terms of the sound effects and things, which obviously were very, very important. You've got to make it believable, but to try and give the audience something which would remain with them so that they would be as as moved and and as affected as uh, as the characters like, you know, um, Alice's character and, and, and the crew and the WAFs and everybody else were and and I th- I think it do- it does that it's um it's a really powerful piece still I'm very pleased I think it's quite timeless in its sound I don't think it's one of those pieces that sounds dated do you know you know some some pieces do I don't think this well because it is set anyway in the Second World War so it's it's well I, I don't think it dates in terms of a broadcast I think you could do it again. There are some things I think you couldn't, but I, I, I think this could, I think, it easily. Well, I, I go back to what I said earlier about, I, I think in many ways it was a groundbreaking event and it, it, it showed that you can make drama documentary and, 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 and particularly drama about the war in a particular kind of way that is very powerful. And, and, and as, as Jonathan said, it, you know, it predates Saving Private Ryan and, and, and uh, Band of Brothers and, and many other dramas. Um, uh, which is quite surprising in in, in a way. Um, it's it's really important that you can that you can make something like that because it sh- it it respects the people who were involved in the story that you're telling. Uh, not only those veterans, but the the, the, the characters that that are fictionalised in the in in the story. They were real people, and they lived through six years of this. And um, you know, it's it's important really to be able to to try and pay some kind of respect. To that, and, uh, and I think the thing did it. And and something that um, happened to me uh, uh, was that I got lots and lots of phone calls after Bomber for the for the next uh, couple of years um, from people like um, sound engineers and producers who were all saying, "What was the music you used in that? And um, <laughs> where did you get the sound effects from that?" And they were they were taking that. They were taking those elements and using them in other programs. And so whoever it was that said, it was Alice, wasn't it? You said it's, it's kind of timeless. I think it's timeless in a way because other productions since Bomber have done the same thing. And there is now a sort of a way of doing drama like Bomber, which people are emulating. So often you hear that narration, that narrative voice mm-hmm. on the radio now and you go, well, that's, that's, that's someone doing a Tom Baker. The way mm-hmm. that we, the way that we interwove the, the uh, interweave the music with the reminiscence and yep. the drama and a bit more narration, that's bomber, and that's done by so many other programs mm-hmm. now. I, I think if if James was here, he'd he'd point out that it's it has definitely left its mark. And chatting earlier today with Dan Elin from the International Bomber Command Center. Len Dyson's take on the lack of moral fiber element of it that you guys do so so well in the show as well has has influenced the way that is seen as well. So the the influence of what you you guys did ha- has lived long and it's it's still being felt and it's still being you know used as a touchstone in modern academic studies about the the study of the Second World War. And I know James is ripping his hair out. James Jeffries, ladies and gentlemen, is ripping his hair out not being able to be here. So I'll I'll have to do a a follow-up with him after he's after he's listened. But I think it is timeless. It is still very powerful. And I think it still makes people discuss the topic, which I think means that the the men and women that those characters are based on are still being talked about, which is fantastic. Yeah, I think I think we played it fair. We played it fair by everybody. We 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 took a responsibility. I mean, I think the my the legacy for me personally is I think it's one of the best things I've ever worked on, uh, and I count myself extraordinarily lucky to have been been in that position. You know, what an what an extraordinary production to to be involved in. You know, every aspect of it was just seemed to. We, I mean, I don't. We really gave a damn about the whole thing. The whole thing, 
every there wasn't a word in it that was kind of a bit on the lazy side. There wasn't a character who's kind of left up a tree, apart from perhaps possibly Mickey Murphy. We undertook it as a sincere piece of work um, that had that carried a tremendous um, historical weight with it, as well as being an utterly dynamic, dramatic piece. And um, I don't think, in my career at least, you know, you you get to work on too many projects like that. And uh, you know, I, I'm incredible. I'm incredibly proud of it. It's really, and I've been listening to, to snippets of it just recently. And yep, yeah, it's uh, it moves. I, geez, Louise, I know what's coming, and it moves me to tears. It's extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. Amazing. Yes, thank you. I cannot thank Jonathan, A, Joe, and Alice enough for their time. They were super generous. We talked for a long time, as you've heard. And you can see the love and the passion that they have for this adaptation and this project even now, nearly 30 years since it originally went out. Within the description will be links to all of their social media accounts, including Jonathan's website, which has the original recordings of the veterans and civilians that he interviewed back in the early 90s. There'll be links to the usual places to buy Len's book and also where you can find the Bomber adaptation as well. Next week, we're going to be looking at Bomber some more, but this time it's placed in the historiography as Dan Elin of the International Bomber Command Center and James Jeffries, who's a historian looking at the depictions of the RAF and media, will be joining me to have a bit of a deep dive. And I have to say, we geek out a bit because we're all fans of the book and the adaptation, but it's, we don't hold back. We do dig into it. That's next week. As always, if you're liking the show, Leave some stars, leave a review in your podcast app of choice. That really helps the algorithms. We're moving around where this podcast lives. So if there's any issues, please do drop me a note and we'll get those sorted. Of course, if you want to join us on Patreon, you can. You get these early with no ads when they start to appear. And also you get slightly different intro, outro and lots of fun stuff going on there. But thank you for your support of the pod. Until next week with Dan and James, which is also a good one. Do take care of yourselves and thank you for listening. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.